Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Lord's house this morning as we worship on the first Sunday in Lent. And as we do so, let us follow the order of service of service of word and sacrament. As we worship today, we will see how Jesus defeats the devil for us. Let us begin with our first hymn, which is hymn 585, While Yet the Morn is Breaking. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given us his one and only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assault of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power, and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O oh Lord, our Lord, how Let us pray. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson, which will also serve as the basis of the sermon, from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, this serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the word of our God. Let's continue now with our psalm of the day, which is Psalm 130, which is on page 114 in front of your hymnals. Our second lesson for today, the first Sunday of Lent, is taken from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more to God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that man, through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification. That brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. This is the word of God. Our verse of the day. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Please stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. 
Gospel of our Lord for the first Sunday of Lent is Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join to sing our hymn of the day, which is from the Christian Worship Supplement, which is hymn 754, The Tree of Life.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The word of God for our consideration today is taken from the Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 3, my dear brother and sister, the Lord. One of the things that I enjoy to do from time to time is I like to binge watch some survival shows. I just find it interesting the amount of fortitude people are willing to pour out of themselves in order to survive in less than adequate circumstances. I find it also interesting to see those who are mentally strong enough to be able to not make the big mistakes that are easy to make when you're at your weakest moment. For instance, in one show, they were marooned on a beach and the fish and the fruit ran out that they knew what was good. And so in their scavenging, they found another tree with a bunch of fruit on it. They didn't know what the fruit was called, but it smelled good, it looked good, and so they ate it. And yet, after eating this unknown fruit, the entire crew that was there, they got cramping, nausea, they were sick to their stomach, they curled up in balls on the beach, they didn't know whether or not they were going to survive, and in the end, they all had to quit. They all tapped out because of the excruciating pain which took place because what was once pleasing to the eye, they found out really quick, was not good for their insides. The devil today in our lesson shows us that the forbidden fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden certainly looked pleasing to the eye, and yet it was a fruit that the devil peddled with sin and lies, which ended up bringing shame into this world, which Adam and Eve body shamed each other, and then it brought about the promise of the cross of Christ. As we look at the beginning of our lesson for today, we see that the devil is having a conversation with Eve. Now this in and of itself is a very odd thing. None of us here have ever seen animals talk unless it's in Mr. Ed or some other cartoon-like show. And yet, here the devil in serpent form is speaking to Eve. Doesn't sound like she's at all alarmed. Doesn't seem like Adam is saying, hey, we should keep our distance. This is new. Scripture doesn't tell us too much about it, but I wonder... I wonder if this is actually the first time the devil actually spoke with Eve. Because it certainly seems like the relationship that he has with her is not one that is alarming. She gives him every opportunity to speak his peace and he, she listens to him in every way. The garden, the world, and Adam and Eve are so innocent they couldn't think of any evil coming from this. And yet, the relationship that the devil forms with Eve bodes some trust to the point where, just as the devil works with temptation in our lives, and just as the devil tried to work temptation in Jesus' life, the devil uses his lies and deceptions to lead us astray. We see that Adam and Eve Two perfect human beings were listening intently to what the devil was saying. Why don't you eat of this fruit? Well, we can't, because if we even touch it, we'll die. <laughs> You're not going to die. And he argues with them and, and states some very in, enhancing points to why it would be advantageous to them to actually eat of this fruit that they knew God told them not to. But yet, how could something that looks so pleasing to the eye do such harm? What could it hurt? And so the sin and lies of the devil convinced Eve that it was fine. So she ate it. She took from the tree another piece, gave that to her husband, and he ate it. And all of a sudden, 
the sin infected the world, the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened. And they could see that they have truly made a monumental mistake. When we think about what Adam and Eve did here, they looked at what the devil was saying, and he always makes his temptations appear to be just fine. Think about the temptations that you have in your life. Think about the sin that the devil uses most often in your life. You know what it is. I'm guessing that the sin that he uses in your life, he uses it much like he did with Adam and Eve. He took what was otherwise a good and fine thing, and somehow he has you think, what's it going to hurt? Right? He has us use our rationalizing mind to think, it's not the end of the world. I'm not going to get too hurt by it. Or, what is even worse, if this is what it means to do what is right, then I don't want to be right. Because we get captivated by the feelings of this world. We get captivated by the sins of this world. And so how easily we fall into that same trap of it looking just fine. It appears to be just fine and dandy. And yet the devil shows us then, after falling into sin, how even things that appear pleasing to the eye can take us under and hurt and harm our bodies and our minds and our souls. And so the devil goes about in working his relationship with us in the same way he uses his relationship with Adam and Eve. He looks at us and he tries the same exact tactic that he did with Adam and Eve. And that is to ruin your relationship with God. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to destroy you in any way possible. He doesn't care if there is a sin in thought, word, or deed. He just wants you to sin. Because he understands that the more you do, the more distance that you are putting between you and your God. The devil doesn't have any boundaries that he is aware of. The devil does not have to think about time off or anything like that. No, the devil is seriously looking to harm you. Just as he looked to harm Adam and Eve in the newly created world, the devil is seeking you like a lion, looking for your times of weakness or when you think you are standing as firmly as you can and he will attack. And he will take what is pleasing to the eye, and he will lay it before you, and he will have you wonder and second guess. He will lay lies before you as he did with Jesus. And he will show you he knows Scripture, and he is the best con artist and the best hack artist that has ever been made. He will twist and distort what he knows of God's Word to take you under. The devil knows. And the devil also knows that the best way of bringing you under is to make you feel the results of your sin. Notice what happened with Adam and Eve. Once they fell into sin, their eyes were open and they immediately felt shame. What was once created by God for godly reasons, their godly bodies, perfectly made for each other, all of a sudden, they were body shamed. Now, body shaming has been something that has been going on for an extremely long time. For those of you who are wondering, body shaming? I don't get it. What is that? I'm guessing you probably have seen it. You just may not have ever heard it described to you. Body shaming is saying anything to make someone else feel bad about their own bodies. And so you look at what people might do, for instance, if someone is trying to lose weight, you body shame them by making fun of their diet or making fun of what they are or not doing, what they are or not drinking, and so on and so forth, to make them feel bad. Well, that is the very same thing. This shame is exactly what the devil introduces to the world when Adam and Eve look at themselves at what was once God's gift to them, their bodies, so that they could use them to glorify God. Now, filled with shame. And he realizes that when we are filled with shame, 
The end goal is to make us absolutely say, there's nothing God can do to help me. Shame is a road to despair. Shame is a road that leads us to throw our hands up and say, God can't help me in this. I am just that bad. It's exactly what the devil wants us to think. The devil wants us to look at all the things that God has blessed us with, and he wants to just insert little things here and there to then make us sin, fall into temptation, and then feel the worst guilt and shame because of the things that we do. And he wants us to come to that very conclusion as Adam and Eve did. I am such a dirty and rotten scoundrel. How could God love me? I've messed up big time. And we see how the devil does this with just regular, ordinary things. Think about relationships. In and of themselves, relationships are good, and yet, what was once pleasing to our eye when it came to relationships, the devil uses things like gossip. Another thing that looks pleasing to the eye. The devil uses lies. Another thing that looks pleasing to the eye. Think about our marriage God uses other things that are pleasing to the eye to have man and woman lust after things that are not theirs. Think about how all of these things that God has given us in this life, our possessions and how we use them, our time and how we use them, going to church and worshiping God and how we do that, and how all of a sudden the devil can use all of these things and twist and distort just a little to have us all of a sudden fall into temptation, into sin, and then into shame. There's no more shameful thing to mankind than what Jesus had to deal with in his life. There's not more of a shameful thing than the cross. And yet, when mankind fell into sin, that is what the Lord God promises them. The Lord God shows them that indeed, for the sins of the world, someone from Eve's line was going to be born, and he was going to come and he was going to crush the serpent's head, although the serpent will strike at his heel. Adam and Eve waited quite a long time, over 900 years, they waited and waited for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of this Savior, the coming of this one heir that will crush the serpent's head. But the Savior never came. And so long they waited and waited and waited. The good news for you and me, the wait is over. We already know who that long-awaited ancestor of Eve is going to be. We already saw what that ancestor did. It is absolutely amazing, if you think about it, that by the cross, the most shameful thing that Christians have ever been hung on throughout all history is the very thing that Christ used to defeat and crush the devil once and for all. You would have to imagine that at the conclusion of Jesus' life, a life filled with great things, a life filled with things that the devil absolutely hated, that the devil must have been giddy on Good Friday. Seeing Jesus dying? I mean, after that horrible display that the devil showed in the desert, after being thrown out of heaven, he couldn't defeat Jesus, and yet he thought this was his victory. And yet, it is through the foolishness of the cross that the Lord Jesus shows that this has always been his plan and even what was thought to be Satan's greatest hour was the Lord Jesus' greatest moment. Where the devil was shouting for joy, the, the devil lost. and He didn't even know it. The Lord Jesus has made it his practice to show the devil that he is more powerful. The Lord Jesus has made it his practice to show that the devil's not going to win. For it was Jesus who cast him from heaven. It was Jesus and the promise of Jesus that the devil brought 
brought about when he brought sin into this world through Adam and Eve. And if you think about it, that crushing blow that Jesus had, that blow of crushing Satan's head, would never have happened if sin was never introduced to this world. It was only as a result of the disgrace of the devil that the Lord Jesus came and absolutely destroyed him. The Lord Jesus in his grace and mercy was content to just have the devil have hell which he created for him. Suffer there. But since the Lord Jesus' creation was tainted and sin brought into this world, the love of Jesus flowed out from that moment to cover over the sins of all people by his death and resurrection from the grave, taking what was once the most shamed thing in the cross and defeating and crushing Satan by it. And remarkably, what was once the most shameful thing in the Roman cross has now been, become the decoration of Christian households. It is the cross of Christ that we rejoice over because we know that this is what is pleasing to the eye. Because Christ died upon this cross and it is empty. The Lord Jesus has risen from the dead and has conquered the devil for us. And we have seen attempt after attempt, but the Lord Jesus stands his ground and valiantly defeats the devil at every turn. Using the sword of the Spirit in the Word of God, and he equips us to do the same. And so, my friends, as you come to dine this day on the Lord's body and blood, be strengthened in the word and understand that it is by this blood that was shed and this body that was broken that Christ Jesus defeated the devil for us once and for all. It is over. It is finished. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join together in confessing our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation, the bounties of the earth, the joy of, love, the joy of life, and the pleasure of friendship the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace 
and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now, dear Lord, hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And in Jesus' name, we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us close with our final hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. <laughs>